Hi, everybody. This is Donna Prosser, Chief Clinical Officer with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. We're here to bring you another COVID-19 update. Today, we're going to talk about the effective management of mental health and stress during this COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm excited to be joined today by four panelists. We have uh, Keita Franklin from Tennessee here in the United States and Bernadette Wilson from California, same place as I am here in the United States. But we're also joined by Anka Sarbu from Switzerland and Ariel Noble from the United Kingdom. So I'd love to go around and have our panelists introduce yourself. Let's start first with Keita. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Yes, I am the Chief Clinical Officer at Psych Hub, which is an online education company. Uh, my background is in social work. My PhD is in social work, where I have had a, a couple decades of work experience working with our nation's active duty military and veteran populations in the area of post-traumatic stress disorder and trauma and suicide prevention. So I'm happy to be with the panel today. Well, thanks. Welcome. Bernadette. Yes, good morning. Um, I represent this group as an advocate for the patients and also the healthcare worker. Um, I'm involved with the patient safety movement on some committees and I just love the organization. I'm also, um, I have my master's in business and I've been in the business environment for quite some time and I am a practicing trainer and also a neuro coach. So I use brain-based technologies to lower stress and really reduce a lot of the, the outputs that we get from um, all of the conditions around us. So I'm really excited to be here and kind of bring together the medical environment, um, along with all of our backgrounds. So thank you. Thanks for joining, Bernie Dan. Uh, Anka. Hi, thank you for having me, Donna. It's a great pleasure to join you um, at the Patient Safety Movement uh, meeting on mental health. Um, as you already know, I'm a Patient Safety Movement Foundation ambassador in Switzerland in Austria. Um, currently, I'm based in Zurich. Um, I work at a mental um, health care uh, facility only for women um, as the head of uh, quality management and organizational development. And in the same time, um, I'm a healthcare innovator with EAT Health, which is a body of uh, European Commission um, on projects on uh, mental health development, um, um, developing tools um, and digital strategies for improvement. Thank you. Great. Thanks for joining us, Anka. And Ariel. Hi. Hello. Thank you for having me, Donna. It really is lovely to join all of you. Um, so, yes, I'm Ariel Noble. I am the research psychologist and the clinical supervisor at Mental Health Innovations, which is a charity in London. Um, and our first uh, project has been to bring Shout, which is a 24-7 uh, digital crisis text line for anyone in the UK, free, anonymous to use. Um, it's actually our one-year anniversary this year. We've had over 300,000 conversations, um, and I am a member of the Data Insights team uh, where we are able to effectively evaluate and uh, consider some evidence-based improvements. Great. Well, thank you for doing Well, thank you for doing So we have a great panel today, and I'm so excited to, to start talking about how, well, let's, let's start talking first about what exactly is happening right now? We all know that this pandemic has, has created a new normal for us. We live in a virtual world with not a whole lot of physical contact. Uh, those with existing mental health issues are finding it challenging to access the therapy and the services that they need. Those um, you know, healthcare workers on the front line and other essential workers are quite stressed. And those with uh, who are dealing with economic hardships are, are also dealing with some some mental health crises right now. So I'd love to just kind of go around. Let's um, if we could start with Ariel. I'd love to understand what you're seeing uh, in the UK and the general population. What are some of the mental health challenges that that you're finding? Yes. So. Our service currently averages around 25,000 conversations a month. And by the end of March, we found that 25% of our conversations concerned COVID. Around 60% of the COVID-related conversations also mention anxiety, which is twice the rate that we usually see. So we have found that anxiety appears to spike in response to major news announcements about the outbreak and have continued to track 
what concerns people most at different stages of this pandemic. So for example, the trend of conversations mentioning uncertainty has closely matched the trend of conversations mentioning the virus. We're struggling with uncertainty in relation to risk, time and duration, whether we will ever return to a familiar state. And interestingly, these concerns have gradually decreased as we have settled more and more into lockdown. Now in lockdown, we're finding that people struggle more with maintaining a routine. This highlights our challenges with change and evolving to a new normal. This also highlights boredom and our need for distraction. People are feeling trapped with themselves. Distress has become inescapable. We're spending more and more time with ourselves, have less distraction and escape, feel more vulnerable and exposed and suffer from the illusion that this is a bad thing. With limited distraction, we face aspects of ourselves and of our lives that have been buried away unconsciously. Just because we didn't notice before doesn't mean that it wasn't there. And so this can be an opportunity to understand and work through it. However, what we do need is a safe structure to do this well. What we need now is a new structure to self-regulate our distress. And developing a healthy routine in lockdown is not only a great way to separate self-regulate emotionally, but also to regulate our sleep, which has also been impacted. It helps us to reset and is essential to our mental health. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, great. I think that's probably true across the world. Um, Anka, um, your thoughts from, from Switzerland and the other German, the German speaking countries that you represent, um, what are you seeing over there? Um, well, I'm involved mostly with the um, organization at the organizational level and the healthcare administration, which is also a focus area of patient safety movement foundation. And what I can tell you is that um, since the beginning, lots of measures have been in place in order to ensure the continuous provision of care for um, inpatients in mental health care facilities. And that was a big focus also in, in my clinic, in my hospital, um, where we actually had to reduce drastically the number of beds because um, of, of the safety measures, of course, of, of the patients as well as of the, of the employees. So um, it was quite challenging at some point. Um, of course, the, the, the pitfall was that um, the number of beds was reduced and the mental health care patients in need of care uh, was uh, the same or even higher. So uh, we were really struggling for a period of time, but at this point, um, fortunately, the, the um, state measurements have become a little bit more light here in Europe, in the whole DAC region. Austria started to, to open lots of businesses, actually, um, which is somehow um, related, of course, also with the mental health status of people. So they can come get back to, to normality um, faster. In Switzerland, we started this um, enlightening um, of measurements uh, two weeks ago. In Austria, they started already three weeks ago. So we are actually now um, recording the, the developments and uh, we are monitoring closely what is happening in in each facility, um, as well as we have to report to the authorities and, um, you know, in, in the German-speaking countries, there are these uh, regional um, healthcare administrations. So we are actually binding to report to them everything that happens in terms of patient safety in, in our hospitals in order to be able to decide at regional level if we are keeping our beds um, at uh, the minimum capacity or we can get back um, to work for better efficiency. So um, this would be something that we had to comply with um, for almost two months. And uh, the worries in, in my area in clinical risk management and quality management was exactly what is happening with the people in need of um, inpatient care that were not able to check into any hospital or um, had to be discharged earlier because this was also a measure that uh, was implemented in many of the hospitals in, in order to reduce the number of beds. Um, so yes, and until now the, the question has been um, how can we really provide the services we want to to all the, the patients in need and um, 
it's thank God in, in, in my hospital, we have been coronavirus uh, free until now, but there have been other cases in long-term care facilities, which have been um, really under critical conditions. And um, yes, now I think it's more of a matter of how are we going to uh, be prepared for what is coming uh, next. Mm -hmm. yes. So that's actually what we're working on right now, more on the preparedness and what Ariel was actually uh, mentioning, uh, what is happening with everything that had an impact on the population that was not an inpatient already. And if they are going to come to us now and how are we going to be able to provide them with the needed care? And how have you done that over the last two months that you've had to decrease your inpatient beds? How have you dealt with um, the, the, how have you treated the patients who typically would have been in an inpatient bed? Um, it was, it was mostly, um, I think, a very challenging time, but uh, in the same time, it was a very good opportunity for the hospitals, um, for the mental health facilities to discover so many digital health solutions that were already available on the market, but were not used at their full potential. So um, what we actually did, it was starting with the triage process. So um, we actually adapted our, our triage of, of patients when we... Um, when we selected them to, to come to us um, on a coronavirus basis. So we were actually testing all of them after um, doing the, the triage form. And um, afterwards, we were trying to optimize our services um, in terms of um, providing, I'm sorry, in terms of providing um, monitoring, um, remote monitoring of patients and teleconferences and um, tele um, psychiatric uh, therapy via digital means. So uh, that was mostly, um, that played a very big role in, in, in the care that we provided in the last month. Um, the good thing is, and I can say this from a healthcare innovation perspective, is that we are keep going on in this way. And it's so good to see that so many uh, long-term care facilities and mental health care facilities um, under these circumstances uh, feel obliged, but also more uh, friendly with um, innovation in healthcare. So, um, these measurements that they um, implemented during the coronavirus crisis are still in place in the Dach region. Um, in Germany, for example, the use of mobile apps has become a thing, um, has become reimbursed by uh, the government. Um, and now family doctors are really prescribing this. Whereas in Switzerland, for example, we um, did not um, actually the, the patient pathway once they, they have symptoms was all digitals, digitalized. So um, everything was happening via phone or video call. They were not going to the hospital unless it was critically bad. So um, they couldn't even go to the emergency room um, if they didn't call before. So that was like really, really good implemented. Um, yes, we are, we are really preparing now for the, for the second wave and we are all skeptical to see what is coming. And um, as I told you, in terms of um, yeah, the perspective of healthcare administration, as well as healthcare professionals and patients, uh, we are trying to, to work a lot on the preparedness of our services to be able to cover um, all the numbers and the wave that is going to come probably after the pandemic, not the second wave of the, of the crisis, um, to be able to allocate all the patients. And we're working hand in hand with, uh, with the ministries and uh, with the local governments to see how we can actually facilitate the needed care for, for people um, who, who are gonna need us. Great. Uh, Kita, you know, you heard Anka talk a lot about what we're doing, what we're doing to help patients at this time. But what are you seeing right now among healthcare workers, uh, whether mental health uh, uh, practitioners or other frontline healthcare workers? How are they? How is the stress manifesting in them right now? It's such a good question. I think this is going to be the future here in the U.S. where we've started to see phased opening. Um, you know, the brunt of the first responder sort of trauma related work has largely been on the hands of healthcare workers. And, you know, we have healthcare workers across the spectrum from, from new nurses, like my daughter, who's a brand new nurse and who is, you know, working in the emergency room here locally, all the way up to very seasoned nurses who have, you know, who are themselves potentially vulnerable um, based on their own, you know, healthcare and family circumstances. And so 
I think that these are the folks that we're going to be caring for as mental health clinicians in the way forward over the long haul, in part, um, you know, exposure to trauma, also the, all the work that's happened. Um, you see a lot of it on the news in the U.S. where um, frontline workers, hospital staff are, um, you know, performing in the roles of family members as they've, you know, stood by the bedside of people that are dying by COVID-related symptoms and they're um, using creative IT technology to uh, help them say goodbye to their loved ones when loved ones are not able to be by the bedside. And while that's certainly commendable and heroic and needed and all, all good, um, it's also you know something that's going to have to get processed by those healthcare professionals in the context of, of trauma exposure. And um, you know even the best the best hospital staff out there are you know they're vulnerable to to trauma and to stress issues, stress-related mental health conditions. And I just, I feel for that group. I think we're going to be taking care of them for the long haul here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and, and Bernadette, what about patients and families, um, folks who are currently having to deal with the hospital system? What, what are you hearing from, from folks? Well, I just, uh, one, I wanted to say thank you, all of you, for your um, contributions. And Ariel, um, I wanted to bring forward also that American uh, Suicide Foundation has an app as well that people can text. So maybe after when this is posted, we could put those numbers in there. Um, and it's really um, helpful. Really help sorry, the, I just wanted, youth. so sorry, I just wanted to actually say thank you, Bernadette, that um, we have been powered by Crisis Text Line from the U.S. Um, so that would also be very helpful to share. Thank you for bringing that up. You're welcome. You're welcome. What um, I think you also highlighted the fact of the unknown. And we know when we don't know and there's change, that puts a lot of stress. That's just our primary instinct. We like to control our environment. So what we're seeing more here on the West Coast versus, I think that was your original question, than versus the, you know, the East Coast of the United States is here in Southern California, we're fortunate when we have the weather. And by nature, we're more we're outdoor people. So you know, the people have to actually walk around each other to take walks. So they, they are really following those guidelines for mental health, which is get out, take breaks, you know, have, take a walk. You know, you'll see families riding their bikes together. Everybody's, you know, especially on Mother's Day. We just had Mother's Day. There was a lot of families out. But they're really very, very respectful. I think people have fear. I was speaking to a client yesterday. They have fear going into the grocery store. They have their primary basic needs. People have anxiety around that. And then they're also overburdened with having their children at home and time management and how are they going to do their job and also um, raise their children that are home and keep them entertained and giving them the best advice as well. So I see this as an extremely complex issue. Then you, and it's also a demographic issue. So we're getting clusters where people are more in a closer confined areas. And then also, we all know it's also for the aging population. And one of the things that we were thinking of remedies of, you know, how we're talking right now in the virtual world, um, there are a few organizations that we can post later also that help seniors with learning how to use technology. I think of my 91-year-old, 92-year-old father who's served in both of our wars and is just a wonderful man. Um, but, you know, he loves to get out. I mean, he still works on cars, but he could not work a computer for the life of him. So, you know, how, how are those type of uh, demographics also um, uh, getting involved? And then you, I also think about our senior population is many of them have illnesses and they have not been able to see their primary doctor. A lot of them um, schedule their whole day around going to the physician. I mean, that is a whole ordeal. You know, how long you're going to be there? What are you going to do? It's a social engagement. So they're really not getting that e either. So there's so many layers to this. And I think just bringing that awareness to it is really helpful. And, and the other side of it, I also have clients that maybe feel that they can't contribute. And there, there's a lot of good ways, a lot of positive ways, such as if you wanted to volunteer online to help uh, senior citizens to use technology, you're able to do that. 
And then just one thing, backing it up, when we're just starting now to open up to see patients in the office. Um, they're also, we had stopped all of the surgeries, unnecessary surgeries. So now they're doing testing beforehand for the patient. And what limited part about if you go in for a day surgery, bringing in a family or friend, that person will definitely, you know, bring a mask, you'll need to have a mask, they're going to be, we're using release forms now. So there's a whole new protocol. And that will lead us later on, you know, when, I, when we talk a little bit more about a patient's bill of rights, and really assuming, there's now more an assumption of, you know, taking responsibility for your own personal health. Before the epidemic, we were in a phase of wellness. It was all about wellness, and I, pre, you know, stopping anything from happening. Now we're more in a crisis mode, and taking now the individual person really has to assume their own responsibility. And I recommend to them to keep binders and folders and just all the information they have. So if I'm talking to you as a medical physician online, I have my questions out. I know what to ask you. I'm, you know, I'm a, I take responsibility as the patient as well. And I think that allows, coming back full circle here, um, there's things that we can do to implement in our life to feel like we have more control and more power because, as we all know, this is pro medicine is moving this way, um, more online and more vir virtual, um, and, and it may be possibly a good thing um, uh, to alleviate a lot of long lines and impacted um, EDs, um, so there's some real positive benefits as well. Mm -hmm. Those are great points, Bernadette. Thanks. Um, Ariel, what are you seeing there in the UK? Are you seeing the same kinds of issues that Bernadette was describing here in the UK? Here in the UK? Yes, I mean, th there's certainly overlaps um, and great points. I suppose, I suppose, like Bernadette said, um, you know, there's a lot now about how we can cope or find ways of coping in this in, in virtually. So technology has become an essential tool and has been for a while for connecting, offering us ways to be listened to, to be understood, to meet our true need, to be cared for and connected with others. Um, coming prepared for that, seeking that out is very important. Uh, and we can use it in many ways. We just need to satisfy those needs. So whether it be through exercise, therapy, um, a doctor's appointment, new skills, hobbies, entertainments, you know, whatever it is that uh, supports your sense of connection and feeling cared for, uh, for yourself and for others. What's interesting, though, is that what I find in the virtual world, um, just in general, you know, there's lots of opportunities for connections, but that they can be both authentic and inauthentic. And so something that comes up for me, it makes me think of Gabor Mate suggests we have two needs, attachment and authenticity, and that we strongly gravitate towards uh, being connected so much so that we might sacrifice our authenticity for that connection, uh, not on purpose, and, and we sometimes don't even realize it, but we might know when this happens because we end up leaving um, a social activity or uh, some sort of social connection, feeling disconnected from ourselves, not feeling heard, not feeling cared for. And so it's important to consider which virtual activities promote your sense of connection and authenticity because it's only when we are being authentic that we can truly feel cared for and, and be connected. Um, so again, what we're hearing at Shout is that this is the first point of meaningful contact for many. It's important that you try and find that meaningful contact um, in any way that you can. Almost half of people who text us say that they feel that they have no one else to talk to or that they've never asked for help elsewhere. So it seems like, you know, again, there's a lot of connection happening, but perhaps a little bit less of sharing something meaningful with someone, which is really important. People most appreciate being listened to and feeling understood. And so, you know, it's really important that collectively, um, whether we're coming from a position of a provider um, or if we're seeking any sort of support, that we continue to develop, encourage, and find for ourselves authentic avenues of connecting. Excellent. So, sounds to me then like every country is really dealing with the same issues. Is that a fair statement, Anka? 
Yes, I, I truly believe that. And um, I would also like to point out um, in, in connection with Ariel, what, what Ariel said, um, the, the meaning of health literacy here and uh, the, big, uh, the big role the health literacy plays in um, the burnout um, of, of, of healthcare workforce in, in the stress level and the mental health issues that uh, might, might cause to general population as well, to the normal patients. Because, you know, we, we have been seeing, we, yeah, uh, we have seen in the last months a lot of misinformation on on lots of channels um, online, and um, most of it also on on TV. And uh, you know, when we're talking here about the isolated elders, for example, and we worry about their mental health, then we have to connect it directly or link it with uh, what is actually published in um, on TV and on radio, as they are not as much on Facebook and other social channels. But um, health literacy, in my opinion, plays here an important role. And um, regarding these points, I, I wanted also to mention that um, I recently launched a, a project here um, in Europe, but we actually gathered also lots of people from around the world, from Australia, Asia, and um, Russia, and the US. Actually, we have advisory board members from the US. It's called the Digital Aid Project. It's a pro bono initiative. And two, actually, of the pain points that we are trying to tackle are related with mental health. Uh, one of them is called... Uh, patient distress to avoid patient distress and uh, the other one is employee burnout and stress level um, so that's actually directly related with with the healthcare workforce what we're trying to do here it's actually um, it's a tailor-made health innovation tool set and is responding to the most common threat and pressing pain points um, in long-term care facilities in general but as I said, two of these are directly related with mental health. And um, we are actually, um, um, va we validated recommendations and we tailored a guideline based on the need-based goal-oriented criteria. And we compile a catalog of ready to implement digital health solutions that are able to tackle these pain points um, and support the long-term care facilities overcome this difficult time. So we actually focused a lot on the elders here and on inpatients also in mental care facilities. And we actually approached the topic of um, remote monitoring, of uh, telecommunication, um, how we can actually talk with the people who are in isolation and how we can bind them closer to the society society, whereas we are implementing social distancing everywhere. So that's a, a very nice, uh, we actually launched it last week in English, and we are preparing it in 10 additional languages in the weeks to come. And I'm very happy to share this with you and with our followers afterwards, uh, because as I said, it's free to download for everyone, and it can help um, any healthcare organization, patient, family, and professional in need. So, um, yes, <laughs> that would be the well, input of the digital that. health project. Yes. We will share that at the end um, and, and uh, make sure everybody has that website. Thank you. Uh, Kita, any recommendations from your standpoint on, you know, what, what can we do moving forward in, in this new world that we're, that we're in? And I think from your standpoint, what I'd be interested in is specifically, what about healthcare workers? Uh, what can clinicians do and, and other essential workers that are on the front lines that have to go to work every day while the rest of us are, are home? How, how can they better manage this? Yeah, it's such a good question. And I picking up also on my colleague here on the panel, Annika's comments about the importance of getting the right information. Um, this healthcare literacy movement in a post-COVID era is going to be critically important for universal populations across the nation, but also subpopulations that might be at distinct risk because of exposure or other pre-existing vulnerabilities. And so at Psych Hub, we also have some good resources I'd like to push out at the end too that are also free related to video-based content on things like anxiety and depression and post-traumatic stress and even suicide risk. And, um, also targeted towards telemental health. So we pushed out a free course to to help teach providers how to how to effectively do telemental health in their in their in their practice in a post-COVID time when you've had to sort of switch to telemental health rather quickly and might need to prepare your practice and maybe that wasn't in your game plan early on as a clinician. So that um, all free resources, but also to get after your question about sort of what do we do? Like what do healthcare workers do or what can we expect moving forward? 
Um, I don't know if, if your listeners would be surprised or not, but I really think a lot of what we do is very basic um, in that we're expecting folks to try their best to, despite the fact that they're working in a telework environment, to um, you know stay on a routine. Um, and also putting back on my hat with regard to your question for what do healthcare workers do, um, also we're wanting them to rely on each other for peer support. You know, when you've been through trauma, one of the best resources is someone else who's been there and sort of done that as well. And so nurse to nurse, medic to medic, doctor to doctor, support each other. Peer support is critically important during this time. And reach out to somebody every day. Don't let isolation uh, get the best of you. Don't withdraw when you might want to. Certainly um, a fair amount of quiet time might be necessary as you're you know, leaving your shift, but it's also important to stay connected. And so keep a good predictable routine, stay connected, follow any and all guidance with regard to the CDC guidelines on, you know, isolating yourself in terms of after your shift, you know, being careful with exposure in that regard. I know all of the healthcare professionals are, are sort of top notch in following that. So it's probably, you know, not necessary for me to say, but the other things I can think of are, um, you know, just your basic principles of, of sleep hygiene, nutrition, and not forgetting to take care of yourself. I know they sound so basic, but sometimes they're good reminders, particularly during times of crisis, like what we're experiencing right now with the pandemic. Yeah, well, we'll be sure to um, to share your psych hub videos that you that you spoke of on uh, at the end of this as well. So so our, our, our viewers are gonna get lots of information at the good. good resources, yep, thank yeah. you. Great. Bernadette, um, you, you talked a bit about the American, Sci American Suicide Foundation hotline. We'll be sure to share that. Um, but you also alluded to uh, patient rights. Can you talk a little bit about what, you, what your recommendations might be for patients and families right now in this crazy time? Well, it's interesting. Pre-COVID, um, we had been working on actually publicizing even larger a patient right, that you have a right to safe care, good care, safe medication, um, and just and access to your knowledge of your, your health care um, information. So that really hasn't changed. It's just how we're going to go about in getting that. So when you go into a hospital now, as I alluded to before, or I stated before, that you should wear a mask, and you really have to look at your healthcare worker as well and seeing if they're taking the correct precautions. And you can do that just by a little investigation. I know here locally at UCI, they're definitely implementing a lot, a lot of protocols to make sure the healthcare worker's safe and also the patient's safe. And we've heard already here on the panel about gradually easing into face-to-face. Um, with the healthcare worker. I think what we should know too is that um, giving um, kudos and respect to our healthcare workers because we do have fear of going into a healthcare office, but I'm going to lay probably a little bit more trust that they are doing the right thing. And I think just again by some of these guidelines, and they are just, they want to keep themselves safe. And what I'm seeing and hearing is they're actually even more overprotective than need be um, to get the virus themselves, which is a great thing and is a good thing. Um, and a, just make sure, you know, if a healthcare worker is going to do an exam on you, make sure they wash their hands, make sure they are masked, make sure you wash your hands afterwards or before they enter and in, in, in exit a room because we know this virus is very contaminant um, through, um, through touch. So... Um, again, your basic rights are just that you have a right to be healthy, you have a right to your information, and again, it goes back to being responsible for your health. So if there's a different point of view, if I show up to an appointment with my binder full of my health care, with some of my records and dates of when I've had my examinations and I know what medications I have, you can then, you have more you're more empowered as a patient to ask good questions, and you can tell when you are not being spoken to with um, in the right way, or also if your questions are not being answered. That's very empowering. Yeah, and we actually at, at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, one other resource that we can we can share it with everybody is um, we have developed a plan of care for folks that they can. It, it's a it's a virtual form, but they can fill it out. 
print, print it out and fill it out, or they can fill it out electronically and start exactly that binder that you were you were talking about. So um, that's a great point. Thank you. Um, I'd love to hear from the rest of our panelists. Any other recommendations for what we can do to live in this new virtual world that we are living in with not so much physical contact? Um, I'm happy to Aria. start. Yeah. Uh, so I feel, I mean, it's just been such an inspiring conversation, actually, and such amazing points have been raised. Um, I think from, you know, particularly the mental health perspective, there is increasing demand across the world for mental health services. Very little has prepared us for how to provide support in times of global crisis when uncertainty and isolation become a shared experience, and that's both for the mental and medical fields. As a digital service, um, our volunteers are based at home, so we've been able to continue to offer support 24-7 throughout the lockdown. This has been one, lead, uh, one leading form of support and continues to offer a way to virtually connect in moments of distress and crisis. Um, and also, I feel really inspired hearing in the conversation, there's been also so many other new initiatives that have launched at this time. So um, our National Health Service has developed a suite of options to support their frontline staff. So extra mental health provision is being provided to NHS staff. Um, and then to offer extra mental health provisions to all UK frontline workers, um, we've collaborated with other partners, um, at Mind, Samaritans, Hospice UK, the Royal Foundation, to run a new campaign called Our Frontline. Uh, we have our leading psychological associations are teaming together to create virtual guidance for mental health professionals to help keep mental health services open. Many organizations for vulnerable adults and young people are developing their virtual and digital access. Uh, domestic abuse, for one, has risen by 25% in the UK since lockdown, and an urgent cross-government intervention plan is currently in progress. There has been lots of collaboration, and we see that it is essential to offer virtual support when human connection is needed, especially at uncertain times of physical absence, high insecurity, and we also realize that our need for virtual care extends beyond the current crisis. So it is is and has been necessary for a while and evidence of its current effectiveness and all of this new innovation will serve to extend beyond this crisis. I feel very excited about that in our conversation today. It is exciting. It is exciting. I think, uh, you know, what, what we uh, ever knew before about Zoom is completely changing, I think, for all of us. So, um, Anka, um, any, do you have any recommendations or tips outside of the virtual world? Just basic things that, that, uh, that maybe people can do to help bring, make, make themselves more mindful. Um, you just mentioned, uh, beside from the, from the digital tools, uh, that's everything I've been trying to do in the last month. It was just like <laughs> trying to, to find the best way to, to implement digital tools in, uh, risk, in risk management, in, in, in crisis management, which was incredibly difficult as I'm dealing with change management myself on a daily basis in, in hospital settings. And that takes years, you know, to, to implement um, projects. Now it has been really, really a challenge. Um, I think um, a big question mark is here uh, uh, that, that, is, that is here is actually how to maintain social connectne connectness how um, while we are actually uh, maintaining uh, social distancing um, but this brings us of course uh, uh, back to the to the technology right um, which I think it's, it's it's just an added value to what our society is giving us right now and um, it's it's gonna make the situation or it could make the situation much better better and, and easier as it has been for, for influenza, for example, back in the, in the years. Um, on, an, on another hand, um, I think mindfulness, it's, it's a very important thing and this doesn't have to be necessarily via technology because there are techniques that we can actually use to, to improve our mental status and we can do that on an individual basis um, from practicing yoga and meditation um, until um, reading and uh, being, uh, again, health literate. Um, I think this would actually reduce a lot our stress levels and um, this would be key probably to, to overcome the difficult uh, situation we are facing um, all over the world. 
If I could jump in here real quick, um, I am a unified mindfulness coach and I use it a lot with my practicing and techniques. What one of the easiest things we talked about walking, we all know walking, you can be very mindful with it, but it is so important to take a lot of breaks, just especially today, even I mean, in this world, and even if you have children running around, you know, just go to the bathroom and deep breathe and take a break. And one of the techniques that I really love is it's called hear out. And um, I lost a child uh, 12 years ago to suicide. And my path through mental health was very long. And but the meditation was one of the things that really helped me and understanding how calming the brain through any stress or trauma can really help you start to see other things and, and bring more clarity to the situation. And this technique, you could do it anywhere, anytime, is if you just sit here and you focus and you listen to out of your right ear first for a few moments, then you listen to your left ear out of a few moments, and you just listen to the sounds. And then we call that hear out. You can actually start turning it in, but that's more you know, after you practice for a little bit. It is the easiest technique because sometimes our thoughts go, we get on our random thoughts and we start ruminating and it does not make things <laughs> any better for us and it really increases our stress level. So this one technique, even it, to try it, just go out on a walk or you could do it after this call or after this video and just sit there and just listen. And it's amazing how much it will reduce your stress so that you would ask for, you know, it's just something that we can implement right now, um, anytime, nobody knows you're doing it. <laughs> you could do it one of you could be doing it right now and I would never know because the best place to listen is actually being in a mindful state so even if your children are coming at you and at home or or you're in a, an awful situation at home with somebody that's abusive you know take some time to really really calm calm your thoughts that's How often? I, I have a question. Thank you very much. This is really insightful, actually, as I'm working two days uh, per week in the hospital and um, the rest of the time I'm, I'm actually dealing with uh, thousands of things from home office, which is really challenging for a healthcare professional. Um, but we're reducing the number of staff in the hospital. So I kind of um, need this kind of technique myself. And I wanted to ask you how often should uh, one do it per day or per week? And um, how long does it have to take? What is the interval that you would suggest us every 20 minutes if you're working at your computer and you can even put you know recommend putting a mindful clock on your computer and it can go ding you know I have a little bell back here but it's just that what happens with the bell is your mind will start listening to it and it's a reminder we also have apps on our Apple phone on our iWatches that can calm you but it's just getting into the habit and not blaboring over it not making that taking a break as being a problem it's just something you just start doing you know, you just feel your level. And I, I love, you know, and I know you guys are mental health professionals, but I love the technique that I learned through cognitive behavioral therapy. It's also, you know, uh, scale things from a, I use a one to 10 scale. If I'm over a four, I back off. And this really, really helped me a lot. It started me to start feeling how I was feeling inside. And you can if it gets too high, a stressful situation, you don't know. And healthcare workers don't have that luxury. They really don't. At times, they really have to be on site. And so a lot of hospitals have implemented things called code, code lilac or code violet, where after there has been an incident, they can, they regroup. They, you know, nursing, uh, chief nursing officers have put this into hospitals. So they can regroup and they really address the mental health concerns of the healthcare worker and they acknowledge it. And I think finally what I'd like to say is as I know in the United States, just from my own path, that nobody talked about suicide 12 years ago. It just, it wasn't a conversation I had with my child. We just didn't talk about it. I am so grateful that within the last five years, we have begun talking about it. And, and with every hardship, such as we're going through right now with COVID, there are these silver linings. And this is one of the most amazing things is like you said, that we're all coming together and there are so much out there and it's going to actually accelerate it, even though it's increasing. And I think one other comment that was said um, about um, as the news comes out, the negative news comes out, 
the incidence rise. They have proven that also. I think there was a study in the UK about suicide, that if they report it in a negative manner, the rate of suicide actually increases. So reporting incidents and really, you know, overriding it with positives um, in our brain and also in our conversations um, does help. It's not glossing over it. It's acknowledging it and then really focusing on the positive aspects of, of what we can control and what we can change. Very well said, Bernadette. Thank you. Any last thoughts from our panelists before we conclude? All right. Well, thank you all so very much for being here today. I very much appreciate your participation. This has been a fabulous discussion. I imagine there's much more to come. We may be uh, asking you to do this again in a couple of months. If that's okay. Thank you very much, Donna. It's been Excellent. an honor. All right. Well, everybody have a wonderful day. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.